chapter 13 in the book of Ezekiel. We left off reading around verse 18. Incredibly important scripture. Hours worth of information here. It is connected to what people do see in relation to the rapture. But that's not what it's about. We will talk a little later, sooner or later, about how it is connected to the rapture. But this is really talking about a second cup. This is talking about a large loss of life from that ritual sacrifice of Isaiah chapter 34, of Revelation 8.8, 8, the flaming mountain, Revelation 13.13, 13, that fire from the sky, as well as many other numbered 13 scriptures about this fire and this doom that's supposed to come upon the earth and sinners. Well, go ahead and pause it. I'm sure you've read it. I read it already. You can pause verse 19 and read it again so you're familiar. I'm going to go ahead and read verse 20. And I went ahead and looked up fly, the original Hebrew for what's implied with the word fly here. And it's just absolutely mind-blowing what you're going to see take place. Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against your pillows, wherewith ye there hunt the souls to make them fly, and I will tear them from your arms, and will let the souls go, even the souls that ye hunt, to make them fly. Before we look at the word fly, I want you to understand that it's describing that this is really an, the plan to, to hunt these souls is ultimately with these mighty men. And they're ultimately influenced by the serpent as well as what we'll just call, as we've been talking, Ishtar right now. That occult agenda, which is chiefly concerned with their propagation with the daughters of men creating these Nephilim children, that serpent seed of the Nephilim children, those mighty men, that was key to their plan, which is to get dominion on this earth. And they needed that descendancy to be able to do it. So I want you to see that the ones that are really chiefly concerned with this plan to hunt these souls and quote unquote make them fly is coming from these mighty men and it's a plan that is stemming from the most ancient of days from the times of Genesis. It's all wrapped up with that original serpent lie for even mankind to become gods and then these gods to get dominion over the earth. Okay, so it's an ancient plan that they are carrying out. This is not just some whimsical hunting. I'm trying to convey that this is a very serious plan that is being worked on for thousands of years that leads up to, to this particular point that we're in right now. It's a, it's a large amount of souls. Okay, so now let's, let's go ahead and read what fly is going to be rendered from the Hebrew in the strongest concordance here. Verse 20, I took fly. And it gave me this number, which is 6524. Let's see if I can zoom in. That's about the furthest I'm going to be able to zoom in. And I'll go ahead and start reading right here. To break forth as a bud to spread, to fly, as extending the wings, to flourish, abroad, abundantly, blossom, break forth, out, bud, flourish, make fly, grow, spread, spring up. That might sound a little puzzling, and I, and I know it does, but
but it's about to make sense. Just bear with me a moment here. I need to take you back to something with Ephraim. As I told you, this is chiefly concerned with the second cup, this ritual sacrifice that they plan, this depopulation event. Even the Georgia Guidestones record their plan for this event. Do not take this lightly. So if we go back to who has been contracted to carry on this great work, this plan that was initiated by these sons of God, by breeding with the daughters of men to actually create the Nephilim and then eventually the descendancy of the elite race that would carry on the great work, who would actually move amongst the kingdoms of men and be the political, religious, elite controllers of the men and the governments of men. And that would take an oath to do this great work, which is all about loosing the seal, breaking the seal to bring their Lord into material form. And then to bring these locusts in, into our material world also. Well, listen to what it says here concerning Ephraim. On verse 13. Unreal. The sorrows of a travailing woman shall come upon him. He is an unwise son, for he should not stay long in the place of breaking forth of children. Well, what are they got to do to, to break forth their children? These troops of Orion that they want to bring in. They have to lose the seal. To lose the seal, they have to commit this sacrifice. Limit the population of the world. That's breaking forth of the children from two conceptual views. It's breaking forth of the Nephilim children, the descendancy of the Anunnaki, the locust, as the army of Joel II in our world, by breaking the seal with the sacrifice. And then it's the breaking forth of children, which is us, the ones that were sacrificed, that are being broke forth in this unique way, describing it with flowering if you can understand what I'm getting at. Just stay with me here and see that I want you to understand this, ver this verse 13. The iniquity of Ephraim is bound up. His sin is hid. Is hid. I told you that that is the source of his iniquity, where he's getting his magic from, where he's getting his occult knowledge, who's influencing him. It's bound up. It's those ones that are bound up. Not only is it the fallen prince of this world, but it's also these ancient Anunnaki lords, the descendancy. That's the sin that's bound up and hid. I told you those are the one that, that had this original plan that has contracted the masons, the tools to do the work now. Now at verse 13 is the fulfillment of, of Revelation 13, verse 13. The sorrows of a travailing woman. That's that's the second cup. That's that fire that comes from the sky. That's the unwise move. He's trying to break forth these descendants of the Anunnaki by breaking the seal. And to break the seal, he has to sacrifice his children as it describes. Verse 13 again, if this doesn't creep you out. Ephraim, as I saw, Tyrus is planted in a pleasant place, but Ephraim shall bring forth his children to the murderer. You see that? Incredible. Verse 14 is what the spirit of truth is saying about us. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. 
Repentance shall be hid from thine eyes. That's the spirit of truth. That's the spirit of Jesus Christ coming through Hosea and saying that after they bring us to this place of the breaking forth of children, meaning they're going to sacrifice us, the people of the world, these nations that are united together to do this, to do this great work, some of these nations are going to sacrifice their own children. America is going to take the lead. This subversive America that is being led by this subversive Freemasonry that's being influenced from these very ancient Anunnaki gods. And then we have this line here, which is going to be so incredible, especially as it relates to these lines here. But I'll just have to come back to that. So understand about this place of breaking forth of children is what Ephraim's trying to do in two ways. Remember, Ephraim occupies two pasture lands. Ephraim's got a double work to do. Give unto her double. We're getting a portion of this double here. Here's what's going to be absolutely amazing. Remember all this about Bud making fly, bloom, flourish, blossom, spread. All of this about flowering and springing up. Whoa. Somehow, the Spirit gave me the sight 20 years ago that fulfills that scripture. You're looking at it. You're looking at the place of the breaking forth of children. And the children that are being brought forth is us. And just as you saw in the strongest concordance, we are being brought forth to that place of abundance, of spring, of flowering and flourishing because we have Jesus Christ. This is that sacrifice that Ephraim is committing, that fire that comes, that he's planning to commit upon the peoples of the world so that they can achieve their crown chakra, this purple here, to achieve their golden age. And I got news for you, friends. They're going to do it. But we're going to be all right. They are only going to speed our way into paradise by making our souls fly. And as you see, all of these souls flying up to this flowering abundance. It's taken me since yesterday to be able to say this to you guys in a way that you could understand me because this is really, really intense to me. You guys know that, as I said, this is drawn as 20 years old. Uh, it's at least a year and a half old uploaded on YouTube and I've never associated these scriptures with it. I've just recently come in contact with those scriptures and those scriptures are completely fulfilled with the sight that the Father has given me even as a young man and once again there's the second cup what it is it's these meteors and asteroids that don't stop there it, it just gonna, it's about to get more amazing here what I, what I need you to know here is that this verse 13, this act that Ephraim is committing here, associated with the woman travailing, which is, as I said, it's this breaking forth of children. She's trying to, to even bring forth the very Antichrist into this world, also with the committance of this sacrifice. But the breaking forth of this children that are going to this springing and this bud and this flowering is us. It's us going to paradise. I need you to understand this line here again in verse 13. 
Ephraim, as I saw, Tyrus is planted in a pleasant place. But Ephraim shall bring forth his children to the murderer. Okay. We need to find Zechariah eleven seventeen real quick. So that you can see further confirmation of Ephraim, the shepherd of Israel, now being referred as the false shepherd, the idle shepherd, who is leaving the flock. I wasn't prepared here. second friends there we go okay Zechariah eleven seventeen. you know that Ephraim was the shepherd of Israel right and that Ephraim fell unto the occult listen about Ephraim woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock the sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye his arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. Now, that verse is what helped give me the understanding to do the video that I did entitled, Why the Illuminati Use the Left Eye. It's a two-part video on the playlist. Watch it. It will blow you away. But what I want you to see here is that the idle shepherd, Ephraim, everywhere you look, has plans to leave the flock. To leave the flock because the sword is going to be upon his arm. Ephraim is bringing his children to the murderer. Well, I want you to hear what our Father says. What Jesus Christ says. And he's going to tell you all about these false shepherds. And he's going to tell you about himself, the true shepherd. Listen closely, because he's telling you about these events. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. What is Jesus talking about right there? Anybody? Line 7 of Joel 2. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall march every one on his ways. And they shall not break their ranks. Do you see that? They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up and down the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The windows is the eyes. This is the army of Joel 2 that's going to come. And that is going to seek with their doctrine to overthrow your understanding of the truth of Jesus Christ. They are going to be like a thief. They are going to climb. They're going to enter in by the windows of the eyes. Remember the Bible says that mankind shall be deceived by his sights. Well, we know Jesus Christ by the truth and the faith of our spirit. We've never seen him, but yet we still know him. We know his voice. We know the voice of the true shepherd. Listen closely. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, that is the army of Joel too. The same is a thief, and a robber, but he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Verily, 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 I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. 
All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and he shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Amen. Praises unto Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ did give his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. This hireling is the idle shepherd, Ephraim. Just as it said in Zechariah eleven seventeen, that he shall leaveth the flock, Jesus Christ's words are exactly tuned in to the truth. This parable is telling you what, what I'm trying to help you see it's connecting to. The hireling is the shepherd in Genesis 49 out of Jacob's own mouth that says, shall now thenceforward be the shepherd of Israel. He is adopted in to the 12 tribes. Ephraim is the 13th tribe of Israel. No wonder that all of this stuff takes place with 13s. Ephraim is the 13th tribe of Israel. He is the hireling shepherd that has become the false idol shepherd. We are not his sheep. And then Ephraim knows of these coming wolves in sheep's clothing, which will be those these false prophets, which are going to be the army of Joel too. As I said, they're going to try to pass themselves off as the Elohim, as the very angel messengers of the Father. But they're going to be true wolves in sheep's clothing. And it says that this wolf will catcheth us and is going to scatter the sheep of Jesus abroad. But Jesus says, you won't follow them. You're going to know the voice of the true shepherd, the one who has already given his life for us and who truly does love us. Hosea 13.13 13 connects to verse 13. The hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and I am known of mine. As the father knoweth me, even so know I the father and I lay down my life for the sheep and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring and they shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. Man. Incredible. Incredible. All those verses, Zechariah eleven seventeen. Hosea 13, 13. Everything that I've showed you here tells a perfect, fluid story that Jesus Christ is fervently trying to get you to understand. He is the good shepherd. This hireling shepherd plans on leaving the flock. The sorrows of a travailing woman shall come upon him. He is an unwise son, for he should not stay long in the place of breaking forth of children. Ephraim is not going to stay long in the place of his supposed power. I hope some of them understand that. Now listen as you understand better what Jesus Christ means when he says this about us that were put to the grave. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, 
I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. Death, the grave, and destruction will have no repentance before the eyes of a living, loving God. Think close. Think close to the spirit of truth. Though he be fruitful among his brethren, talking about Ephraim from Genesis chapter 49, who is prophesied as being fruitful among his brethren, an east wind shall come. The wind of the Lord shall come up from the wilderness. His spring shall become dry. Remember that spring of many waters? His fountain shall be dried up, the abyss. He shall spoil the treasure of all pleasant vessels. Unfortunately, Ephraim is still going to try to spoil our treasure in heaven. We are those pleasant vessels and our treasure is in heaven. He's going to try to destroy it. He's going to try to spoil it. There's a deeper plan with what these mighty men have with trying to stop the soul ascension that we have towards the Father. But just as you saw Jesus Christ declare death, destruction, and the grave, he's going to destroy them and he will ransom us from the hands of the deceiver and rip us from these very hands of the deceiver and bring us forth to this place of budding, blossom, and abundance, the spiritual kingdom of the Most Highs. I'll be back. <laughs>